I'm here to convince you today that the streets and public spaces of our cities are not only central to our thriving democracy, but they're also potentially key to world peace. On January 21st, 2017, five million people around the world came together to stand up for women's rights and democracy. These marches took place on the tundra, frozen tundra to the north, to even a cancer ward in Los Angeles. But for the most part, they took place in public spaces and streets. From Fairbanks, Alaska, to Houston, Texas, to Paris, France, five million people converging on the city to show their force of democratic action. This experience was both personal and intergenerational for me. I attended, as you see, with my mother, my daughter, and my 10-year-old my daughter, and my sister. It was such an extraordinary moment to feel connected to humanity at this one time, moment in time. But importantly, as a public space designer and landscape architect, which is what I am, it was also a moment of realizing the value of my profession, that the ground beneath my feet was actually the medium for this incredible global human network. And I was scanning social media, and I was looking across all of the places that I work and currently working in, like Congress Avenue in Texas, and Moore Square in Raleigh, these are my projects, and Ithaca, New York, just to see how are these places faring under this extraordinary crush of people. My firm, also, that I work for, also designed parts of Pennsylvania Avenue itself, so the very platform we were standing on as a 1980s kind of landscape framework, and then again recently as an urban design framework. Now, Pennsylvania Avenue had an extraordinary weekend that weekend in January. One day, it hosted hundreds of thousands of marchers. 24 hours earlier, it was the route of the presidential inaugural parade. And 24 hours before that, it was a normal street that was carrying cars and pedestrians and bikes. Think about that for a second. Imagine designing a room of your house where one day you're going to host a hip-hop dance party the next day, have an elegant candlelit dinner, and on the third day, park your car. That's what public space designers think about, how to kind of accommodate this incredible array of use. But public space isn't just about protest, right? It's from the beginning of time. It's the place where people experience community in cities. From the Agora in ancient Greece to the Village Green in New England, public space is our common ground. It's where we in cities make connections to other people. And this is important because the world is urbanizing. Currently, 50% of the world's population lives in cities. In the US, that's 70%, and it's expected to grow to 80% by 2050. And so to make cities livable, we need public spaces, and public spaces is where people in cities live their lives. It's where we experience commerce and shopping. It's where we experience celebration and come together to feel community. It's also where we collectively mourn and grieve after traumatic events. Increasingly in the 21st century, it's the place where we experience health and wellness and take care of ourselves, and where we take our kids and our families to experience joy and play. So that all sounds good, right? What's the problem? Well, at the same time we're seeing an increase in the value of public space and a recognition of that, we're also seeing it come under attack. And so you think about what happened recently in New York City or what's happened in Charlottesville, and you see that terrorists and disruptors are understanding that connection to community, and so they're hitting us where it hurts, attacking us at our core, which is our sense of connection and community. And it's happening, as we've seen, not just in our country, but all over the world. As a public space designer, this is a really interesting conundrum. How do I think about designing for places for people, but also where they feel safe and welcome? And there's an extraordinary array, a field of specialists, really, who deal with security landscapes. A few examples, uh, the recent um, recompletion of the Sandy Hook Elementary School, the rebuilding of that, includes a long processional to the front door, which prevents what may be what happened last time, but also creates a beautiful arrival sequence. Our own work on the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool uses walls and edges to prevent cars from becoming part of this really important public space. And then there's all kinds of clever integration of bollards and security measures and landscapes, like in Wall Street, where there's a swivel on the ground where the bollards actually move to allow cars to pass sometimes and be blocked others. And this is, these are great tactics when you know there's a specific threat, but the problem is that we're seeing this proliferate and become more diffuse. So, so my concern as a public space designer is that we might start designing these spaces for more increased threats and that might compromise the very democratic values that public space promotes. 
we could start thinking about, for instance, fortification of our public spaces, that if we just put up more walls, we can protect ourselves. We saw this after 9-11, uh, ironically, where the Philadelphia's Independence Hall, our beacon of freedom, was almost behind bars of temporary security measures. Bollards are wonderful. I use them a lot as landscape architects, but they also send a subliminal signal to people that you're not really safe here. There's a threat present, and that really does impact the way people understand space. And certainly, you could elevate this to the national dialogue about how we address threat or perceived threat and what that might mean for our community. We could increase surveillance, right? And as a city dweller, I know everywhere I go, I'm probably on camera somewhere, whether an iPhone or a security camera, you come to accept it. But when you design a public space that's purposely made to be surveilled, it can lack humanity, it can lack comfort, it can lack connection. Similarly, with police presence, sometimes it's really positive and needed, but it can hit a tipping point where it starts to become concerning or intimidating. And then lastly, probably my biggest fear is what if people start retreating? What if they stop going and participating in public life and public space out of fear and retreat deeper into their screens and iPhones? It's a funny cartoon, but it really speaks to this notion of the echo chamber we hear about a lot, this idea that people are isolating themselves in like-minded communities. And we've seen again and again that isolation actually does breed kind of terrorism and violence and those tendencies where connection can help us overcome it. In Boston, after Charlottesville, we saw crowds of people, a protest and a counter-protest, purposely separated to keep violent skirmishes from happening. And that was wonderful that nobody was hurt, but it made me nervous about our ability to have constructive public discourse. And if we start separating people consistently, how do we ever find common ground? Again, the role of landscape. So I'm suggesting today that we can design not for threat, but instead for promise that we can think about public spaces that actually embrace a sense of connectivity and community and bring us together around um, collaboration and public discourse. That instead of designing for fortification, we should be designing for exchange, purposefully creating places where people have to come together and confront other. We've been working in Syracuse University where we've been working on an open space framework for that campus, looking at how to renovate and think about their open spaces. As one idea, there was a street that was closed for many years to cars and students used it, but it's still very much red like a street in the landscape. And the idea was to convert it actually into a public space where people could gather. Now you might look at this and think, well, that's a really pretty project, kind of nice to have uh, a beautification project. Uh, and not see it necessarily as core to the campus's educational mission, which members of that community did. They said, why are we spending money on this? This is a place of education, not a resort, right? The project moved ahead and opened last year. Just some images of this under construction, or, or just recently opened. But what you see, even days after the project opened, is that people were coming together in this landscape. People are connecting in new ways where they were just passing through that street before, and now they're coming together and talking openly and sitting together. And really heartwarming to me as a designer, within days of it opening, this place that was protested became a place of protest. They had this huge Black Lives uh, Matter die-in. And so I ask you, is this kind of conversation core to an educational mission? Is confronting these kinds of issues in our society a beautification project, or is it really central to the way that we think about our society and culture. I think we can connect people instead of retreating. I've been working on a project called the Lawn on D in Boston. It's a really interesting kind of social experiment next to the convention center there. We thought, let's do a temporary landscape and see what kinds of uses we can put here that will bring people together. Very inexpensively constructed of asphalt and lawn with a tent. But what we really invested time and energy in was finding ways to create furnishings and temporary art installations that would provoke people and provide comfortable spaces um, so that people are kind of forced to interact with each other in new ways. And what we've seen is a public discourse happening in this public space. We see people, in this case, by a fire pit, having a long extended conversation that they might not otherwise have. We see people collaborating in new ways in public space, here building snow forts and snowmen. This was our snowmageddon some winter, if you remember that. We see people coming here just to experience joy and fun and probably bumping into people that they might not normally otherwise bump into. 
And then lastly, I think that we can build for community, right? We can purposely design to build, bring people together and to build community. I've been working for the past decade on the Chicago Riverwalk, and similar to Syracuse, this was an underutilized gray space uh, that nobody spent time in that sort of sent a sad message. And over many years of work, we've converted this into a people space. Again, one of physical connection, but community connection, bringing people into contact with each other and also the river. And we purposely designed this so that people had to experience each other. The seating enables people to sit in different ways. They can bump into people they might not otherwise bump into. It's just an extraordinary people place where you might meet someone you just couldn't have imagined talking to, whether in groups or introverts kind of having small conversation. This is really key to the way we think about how we want to live in, in public. And again, public spaces, and, and, and we see this on the Riverwalk, it attracts people of every race, of every age, of every generation, um, and it really is that common ground that brings people together. It's this sense of connection to each other and to a sense of place that I think really can serve as kind of an antidote to isolation and violence. So I don't know if I convinced you today, but I hope you walk away from this understanding that public space is more than beautification, right? Publication is core to the way we think about democratic society. It's also a, a cry, really, for us as a divided society to build places that bring us joy and meaning and connection. And I think, again, it's about designing, instead of thinking about designing for the threat of what could happen, design for the promise of healing and peace. Thank you.